We started looking at Peter last week in this outline of the apostles, and there's so much about Peter. Of course, we talked about his names, um, mentioned a total of 212 times in the New Testament. Obviously, throughout the Gospels, since he is one of the one of the twelve, I have all those references in there for you. But I wanted to kind of, just for a few minutes this morning, focus in on his role in the book of Acts. The last time we read of Peter, excuse me, in the book of Acts, is in chapter fifteen. Of course, we have we have him mentioned in uh, Acts one with the other apostles gathered in Jerusalem. They're waiting for the promise of the Father, which was the the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, so they could uh, preach. And of course, Acts chapter two, you have the well. Let's just turn over there real quick. You turn over to Acts chapter two. You have the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit coming upon Peter and the other apostles. And they begin speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, or that is, as the Spirit gave them the ability to do so. And so the, mir- the miraculous then there in Acts 2, there's, there's an interesting idea some people have that the, the miracle was with the hearers. Well, no, the miracle was with those who were speaking. And because if you look down at, look at Acts chapter 2, and... Uh, I'll start in verse 6. It says, Now when this was noised abroad, and the multitudes came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And so there's your indicator right there. They're speaking in these languages, and we hear our native tongue. And the term there in verse 6 for language is the Greek term dialectos. Dialect, it's a human language. And they're hearing it, and they're, they're saying, those guys are from Galilee, how are they using our language? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? There again is that term, dialectos, in which we were born. And then you have the places mentioned there. And uh, so, you have all the apostles speaking. I don't know exactly what that looked like. But they were all speaking. And we don't know how many were there. Um, you know, there's estimates of upwards of a million people, a million Jewish people in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, uh, one of those three yearly feasts where all the males of Israel were required to attend. But uh, we are told, as Peter begins speaking, verse 14, in fact, look at verse 14. It says, but Peter standing up with the eleven. So again, it's obvious that all twelve are speaking. But it's Peter's sermon that is recorded for us in Scripture. And he tells us, beginning in verse uh, well, beginning in verse 16, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And look at verse 17, Acts 2, 17. It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God. Now notice this. A lot of people just kind of and I've heard this done, they kind of read over this. I will pour out my spirit. Well, that's not what it says, is it? What does it say? I will pour out of my spirit. And the Greek term there that's translated of, which is a is, is actually a preposition meaning from. I will pour out from the spirit of me, is what the Greek language actually says. The power here, the the ability that was given to them, obviously, you go back to verse 4, was given to them by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit Himself, as a being, was not poured out on the apostles. It's the power from the Holy Spirit. I will pour out from the Spirit of me. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, obviously, as you progress throughout the first century and throughout the rest of the New Testament text, you have the miraculous manifestations. Obviously, you have them recorded through the Gospels. You have them recorded through the book of Acts. And then you have them mentioned time and time again throughout Paul's letters and Peter's letters and things like this. But the, the, the phrase there in Acts 2.17 is extremely important. I will pour out from the Spirit of me. 
That's God speaking. And Peter says, what you, in fact, look how Peter connects it. Because, you know, the audience sees all this and they said, these guys are drunk. Peter says, no, it's only nine in the morning. This is what was spoken by Joel. So look down at verse 33. As Peter's kind of concluding, he says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He, God, has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. So everything you are seeing today and hearing today is a fulfillment of all these prophecies. Obviously of Joel's prophecy, but then you look at verse, uh, beginning in verse 25, down through verse 28, you have a quote from Psalm 16, verse 11. That's applied to the events of this day, specifically regarding the resurrection of Christ. And then you have other prophecies mentioned, uh, verses 34 and 35, quotes from Psalm 110. So the things you folks are seeing and hearing today is the pouring forth from the Spirit of God, giving us this ability. This is all in fulfillment of those prophecies, not only of Joel chapter 2, where Joel says in the latter days or in the last days, this is going to happen. But you have Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter 2, where he talks about the word of the Lord going forth from Jerusalem in the latter days. Uh, Micah, Micah's contemporary with Isaiah, but they're in different locations. Micah has basically the same prophecy. Micah chapter 4 and verses 1 through 4. The prophecy is of what would happen, where it would happen, when it would happen. And, and that's, so that's how Peter brings it all together with the prophecy of Joel, verses 17 through 21 here. And then you get to verse 33. This is all in fulfillment and it's poured out. What, what you are seeing and hearing today, all of this is being fulfilled. And so you have the kingdom of God then established there in Acts chapter 2. So again, just looking here on page 7 of the outline... You notice again all of the mentions of Peter throughout Acts, all the way up to Acts chapter 15. And then you have the missionary journeys. Really, And the missionary journeys really begin in Acts chapter 13. And some people struggle with... You've got Peter in the first half of the book, and then you've got Paul in the second half of the book. And some people see almost, um, almost a contradictory nature of the book of Acts. Well, there's no contradiction. And that's, I think that's kind of... So it's called the book of Acts. If you look in your Bible, well, like mine says here, Acts of the Apostles. And I've, I think I've told you before, a, a more accurate description of, or a more accurate title for the book of Acts would be some of the Acts of some of the Apostles. Because we don't have everything recorded that every Apostle ever did. And so people struggle for some reason... Well, it, you have Peter focused on here and then Paul focused on here. Maybe there's two different authors. Maybe there's mistakes or whatever. But anyway, uh, it's showing God's work going on throughout the Roman Empire with different people. Well, I think that'll do just looking at Acts there. He, and obviously, Peter was a, um, a prominent part of the early church, but so were the other apostles. And again, every apostle had received the same power and same authority from Jesus. You go back to Matthew chapter 10 and verses 1 through 4. I mean, Judas himself had the same power and authority that Peter had. So there's no, there's no elevation of one apostle above another. They're, they're equal. Now, we have different records in Scripture. Yes, but that doesn't place one apostle above the other in importance or in authority or anything like that. We need to keep that in mind. And then you have Peter mentioned a few times after Acts. And actually, he's mentioned three times by Paul in Galatians. And then you have First and Second Peter, obviously, near the end of your New Testament. It's kind of interesting to me. And, and Paul does write about this. He writes about it, in, particularly in Galatians chapter 1. Of course, Luke wrote about it in Acts chapter, primarily in Acts chapter 9. But then you have some other stuff in Acts 22 and, and also in Acts 26. That the events that surround the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, which that's who we're getting ready to look at next. But then his, his interaction with the other apostles after that point. So he met Paul 
Peter met Paul three years after Paul's conversion. Galatians 1 tells us that. This is interesting to me. Something I thought I'd point out. Any questions or comments on Peter? All right, let's look at Saul of Tarsus, referred to as Saul 22 times in your New Testament. Uh, you have his, uh, what I call his pedigree, his educational background, his, his uh, Israelite background in Philippians 3, verses 4 through 6. And obviously he was a persecutor of the church. Somebody, in fact, somebody turn over to 1 Timothy 1 and read verse 13, please. 1 Timothy 1, 13. Okay, that word insolent, uh, the, the Greek term means violently arrogant. That's the type of person that Saul of Tarsus was, specifically against the church, that, and that's what he's talking about there. He was violently arrogant, zealous for the law. And he talks about that again uh, in Philippians chapter 3 there. But he put, man, he put everything he had into doing whatever he could to bring an end to to this Christianity thing. There's a lot of animosity there. And it's just amazing when you look at that, when you, and when you go to Acts chapter 9 and you see him confronted by the Lord himself, and he talks about that to some extent in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. He talks about himself as one who was born out of due season. You know, he wasn't called with the other 12 apostles. He wasn't one of the original 12, but he was called directly by Christ to be an apostle. And when you go to Acts chapter 9 and you read this account, look at, uh, well, Acts chapter 9, verse 19. And we had received food, he was strengthened, and then, Saul, then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were in Damascus, and straightway, or immediately, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Well, that's why he had just been killing people, because that's what people were saying. Uh, and now... So you keep reading through there uh, in Acts chapter 9 and verse 23. And after that, and after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So now the, the, the coin is flipped, as it were, to being from going from being persecutor to the persecuted. And just as it seems to me, when you follow him through the book of Acts and then you read some of the other things he writes in his letters the persecution that, that he endured as a Christian was just as violent and uh, a, a New Testament word, vehement, vicious, as his was against the church. And so he, I, you know, I have no doubt in my mind as he was, as he was preaching and, and traveling around on these missionary journeys, that never left him. What he went through, or no. Yeah, what he, as he was going through what he went through, what he had put others through in his past. I, I have no doubt. And again, what, what you read there in 1 Timothy, that never left him. Anyway, uh, of course, we, we touched on this the other day. He assisted on the martyrdom of Stephen. He held the coats of those who were killing Stephen. Made havoc. The King James says that is he treated violently or attempted to ruin the church. Uh, and just some other facts about him there, just some other information. Let's see. Okay, so he's called Saul 22 times. He's referred to as Paul 162 times in the New Testament. The name change is noted in Acts chapter 13 and verse 9. And he is only referred to as Saul again after this point when he recounts his conversion. You know, when he talks about himself in the past tense. And so that's just a, just a note there. A freeborn Roman citizen. In fact, he used that in his defense on one occasion, as recorded in Acts 22. He knew the laws of the land. He used the laws of the land. He was a tent maker. Talked about his education, his travel. So I looked at this, his travels. When you add those together, 6,900 miles. You think about... You know, for us, so we had that when we moved here, and up until December, we had that uh, 
Toyota Sienna. We bought that thing in 2012 and we put 150,000 miles on it. And you know, for us, that's, you know, it's just getting broken in, right? <laughs> As we say. But you know, you, you go back to, you're either walking or you're on a boat somewhere or you're riding an animal and you're going 6,900 miles. So that would be like going from the, the farthest point on the eastern coast of the United States to the farthest point on the west coast and back and then halfway again. That's about the amount of travel that Paul did on his missionary journeys as you map them out. That's quite something. And the whole time he's going, he's, I mean, he's being chased from city to city and everybody's trying to kill him who's chasing him. And he kept going. He never quit. Now, and, and so he has three, what I call intentional missionary journeys. His fourth trip was to Rome. And how did he get to Rome? Well, yeah, but why did he get to Rome? He was a prisoner. He, he, had, a, he had been arrested. You go to Acts chapter 22 and 23. He's under arrest and he faces several, tri uh, several trials and he finally appeals to Caesar. So in a sense, that's not really a missionary journey, but that trip's not included on this mileage. It's just amazing to me to think about all that he did in spite of all the opposition that he faced constantly. Again, you just... Follow it through Acts and nonstop. I talk about his fearlessness a little bit here. The, the, some of the accounts that were told. But then also we talk about his care for others. You know, when you go through a lot, when you're put through a lot, particularly by other people, it's, I think it's, it can be very easy to become untrusting, you know, and to become very cynical about people and just kind of maybe even to, a, to, to an extent, maybe even isolate yourself from other people because they've treated you so badly. And yet you read passages and th this is just three examples that I thought of, but the, the care and the love that he had for everybody that he was trying to work with, even people who were, well, I'll tell you what, let's go to second Timothy chapter four real quick. Even people who wronged him, how he wrote about them or spoke about them in his writings. Second Timothy four, talking to Timothy, second Timothy four and verse nine, he says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me for Demas hath forsaken me having loved this pleasant wor uh, present world and is departed unto Thessalonica. Only Luke is with me. Verse 11. Tychicus I have left in Ephesus. Alexander the coppersmith, verse 14, did me much evil. The Lord record him, reward him according to his works. You know, what might we say? Somebody who does us much evil. I hope they get it back. I hope somebody does them like they did me. Well, he just says, Lord will handle that. Nobody, at my first answer, no man stood with me, verse 16. All men forsook me. Uh, and there are other writings where he talks about people who wronged him. And he'll say something like, let not that be laid to their charge. It just kind of shows the man that he was. In spite of all that he went through, you, you repeatedly see his care for other people. And so one thing that I included on this list, there's 23 points here. At page on page eight and on to page nine, and that's where the outline ends. What's called the one another passages of Paul, things that he wrote about in terms of care for one another. Um, so I've got an interesting question that's come through on the live stream that I want to address because we do see this happen. <clears throat> Several times in Scripture, and that has to do with name changes. So one person asks, why do, you, why do you think, did God change the names of those people He called to His service? Well, so we're, we do our family Bible reading every day. We sit down together, the four of us, and we, we read one chapter out of the Bible together. We just, we're going through the, the accounts of Abraham and Sarah. And what was it? Is it Genesis 17, where Abraham and Sarai's name, Abram and Sarai's name, are changed to Abraham and Sarah. 
And I think that's just a good illustration. A lot of times these name changes are used to portray something that is going to happen or perhaps that has happened. Um, Yeah, so Genesis 17 records this. Sarah's name change is recorded in Genesis 17, 15. As for Sarah, your wife, you shall call her name Sarah, and I will bless her and give her, uh, give you a son by her. Abram's name, which means exalted father, is changed to Abraham, which means a father of many. Well, that was in direct connection with the promise. But then you see other accounts or other examples of name changes, like in the book of Hosea. And these aren't actually name changes, but these are names actually given. Hosea and his wife had children, and God instructed them to give them certain names. Uh, Hosea chapter 1 and verse 3, for instance, uh, they have a son and they're to name him Jezreel, which that name means God scatters. Well, why would, why would he be given that name? Well, because I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. Israel was going to be scattered in Assyrian captivity. And so that prophet's son's name was used as an indicator of something that would happen. And they had another, that, well, then they had a daughter named Lo Ruhamah. God said, name her Lo Ruhamah. And the reason is, I'm not going to have mercy on the house of Israel anymore. And her name means no mercy. So I think there, there are several reasons why names are either changed or names are given in the first place. Now, in regard to Saul, that is recorded for us in, what did I say? Acts chapter 13 and verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're not given really any indication as to a specific why. And I just frankly, I haven't looked it up. I haven't studied that. So I can't answer that in regard to Saul. But there are some indicators as to why God either gave specific names or changed names in, uh, in those days. And it, and, okay, Jesus. What does the name Jesus mean? Anybody know? What? Savior. What about Emmanuel? God with us. I mean, there, there are meanings behind these names. And uh, there's something to that. I, I, I would say probably we don't pay as much attention to it here as other cultures have and probably do. But it's interesting to look at names sometimes and what they mean. So the one another passages of Paul, we have just a couple of minutes left here. It just again, it shows his, it shows his heart. It shows the kind of person that he was, and were members one of another, kindly affectionate to one another. I mean, we could go on and on here. I'm not going to read it. You can read yourself, but uh, those are very interesting passages to study when we think about our relationship with one another as Christians. This is how we treat one another. This is how we don't treat one another. Any questions or comments on any of that? Yes. 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 Okay. They stoned him to death. I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that's correct because most everybody else kept their name as recorded in Scripture. So I don't know. Jacob was changed to Israel. Jacob meant supplanter and Israel meant struggles with God. And that happened, it's recorded in Genesis 32 when he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. Okay, I, I don't know. 
Okay, so we're going to start a new study next week. I, I posted in our private group about this, and uh, I had this book a long time ago. It was written, it's written by Frank Dunn. It's called Know Your Bible, and it's an analysis of every book of the Bible. It's not a verse-by-verse -verse study, but I think it's a very worthwhile study for all of us. And uh, I picked it up Thursday. I found a copy at the Memphis Lectures. We left here Wednesday night after the paper was done and uh, went to the lectures Thursday. So that's starting next Sunday. That's, that's what we're going to be doing. And I'll, I'll have material for you, but I think it'll be very beneficial to kind of do a, a survey of each book of the Bible and have all that material. You know, I try to make this material for myself, but you have it now too. And so I hope that you can benefit from it. You know, buy a three ring binder and keep this stuff. Uh, hope it, I hope it's helpful to you. All right, guys. Appreciate your attention.